Welcome to NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're broadcasting live from LC-39, just across the water from the Atlas V, which has begun to roll out, carrying the Solar Orbiter spacecraft out to the pad. You know, Blair, it never gets old seeing an Atlas V roll out to the pad at Complex 41. But I, I gotta tell you though, it's not very warm here in Florida. It's, it's kind of <laughs> cold today. <laughs> it actually is, and, but regardless, a very exciting time here on the Space Coast for space exploration and science today. I tell you what, over the course of the next 30 minutes, we're gonna have a lot of content. We're gonna be focusing on the sun, the Solar Orbiter mission, and the Atlas V vehicle. That's right, and we have a special guest today. Speaking of Tiffany Nail, her brother is gonna be filling her shoes out at the pad with Mick Waltman. They're gonna talk about the Atlas V and Solar Orbiter as the rollout completes later in the show. Well, I tell you what, we have a lot to cover, so let's get started, Blair. Absolutely, we'll go to the pad and then we'll come back with our first guest, Holly Gilbert. We're being joined now by Holly Gilbert, who is the Heliophysics Science Division Director at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and the Project Scientist for Solar Orbiter. How you doing? Great, really good. So what, t give us your thoughts. You see the rollout of the, of the Atlas V vehicle, Solar Orbiter. It's amazing, it, it really is. I have goosebumps to tell you the truth, not just because of the weather, but because of the excitement of the rollout. Tell us, why is it important for us to study the sun? Well, of course, the sun provides everything, right? Life here on Earth. But we also are impacted by its moods and its activity. It's incredibly dynamic. We're embedded in basically its atmosphere, its extended atmosphere. So whatever happens on the sun, solar storms, solar wind, it affects us here on the Earth in what we call space weather. And it interacts with the Earth. It can damage satellites. It can be dangerous for astronauts. It can cause power grid outages. So uh, space weather is a, is a very important field to study. Now, of course, as everyone knows, we are going back to the moon in 2024. We're gonna have the first female astronaut to land on the surface. And how is studying the sun sort of impact that, that journey to, uh, back to the moon? Yeah, like I mentioned, so on the surface, we're protected from all that space weather because we have the Earth's magnetic field and the atmosphere, but those astronauts are gonna be outside of that shield. And especially once they're on the moon and especially all the way to Mars. So we need to be able to forecast and predict and we need to understand the fundamental physics processes in order to do that. Our models need us to feed them information. Solar Orbiter will help provide that data to do that. Now, as project scientists, what is your role in the mission? Um, I, well, I get to do fun stuff like this. <laughs> um, but really, uh, this is a collaboration, so I work closely with the ESA project scientists as well. And we really oversee the, the science objectives and make sure that the data is going to accomplish what we're trying to do scientifically. And we work with all the teams, the 10 instrument teams. And so it's, it's a really collaborative effort. Now, you know, Blair had a chance to sit down and talk with Cesar Garcia, who is the project manager for Solar Orbiter for the European Space Agency. So let's learn more about the Solar Orbiter. Great. We're here at Astrotech Space Operation with European Space Agency Project Manager for the Solar Orbiter, Cesar Garcia. Cesar, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, thanks you for having me. The first question I want to ask you is, tell us a little bit about the overall mission for Solar Orbiter. Okay, Solar Orbiter mission, as the name shows, it's a space mission that will orbit to the, around the sun in ways which we have not done before. We will be different in that we will be relatively close to the sun, and we will also change the orbital plane so that we can observe the poles of the sun. We will investigate also the solar wind and features close to the surface of the sun. Then they will also look into the heliosphere, and we all live in the heliosphere of the sun. And finally, they will investigate the reasons why we have this 11-year cycle and what drives this solar variability. Some of the instruments are going to be capturing images. What are those images gonna look like? Well, we capture images in various frequencies across the spectrum. Normally, science instruments, or well, also Earth observation instruments, they don't take what we call white light pictures. We try to take pictures in a very small frequency band, and then we combine those various frequencies to create broad spectrum images. Now, Solar Orbiter has instruments in the visible, uh, so the various colors of the visible, a little bit in the infrared, also in the ultraviolet spectrum, and all the way up to the X-rays. So the various instruments will detect these images in different ways. And what the scientists do, they combine various frequencies to create, well, pretty pictures as the one we have in the background here. Now that's one element. And the second element is that uh, the various instruments, they have different fields of view. Some of the instruments will be able to capture the complete solar disk, 
And at the same time, they will be able to look with very high resolution into very small portions of the sun. Some of the instruments will be looking at the rim, or to make things more interesting, when one of the instruments detects a feature of interest, he will send automatically a trigger to the other instruments so that they can also change mode of operation and focus on that specific feature to learn more about it. And if that involves, for instance, the ejection of material or a change to the solar wind, when that happens on the spacecraft, then also the in-situ instruments will be able to react and to sense that specific feature. And that combination of things which happen on the surface or close to the surface of the sun, and then at the location, later on at the location of the spacecraft, is one of the key features and unique features of Solar Orbiter. There are a lot of fascinating and important instruments on the spacecraft. If the scientists see something interesting during an observation, do they have the ability to adapt and, and sort of reorient to, to, to take a look at that interesting event? Yeah, they, they want to maximize the opportunities, of course, and there are several ways of doing that. Uh, one way is something that we call the short-term planning, as opposed to long-term planning. Long-term planning is what the scientists do. They plan every instrument, every mode of operation, like six months in advance. However, every 24 hours, if they see a particular feature, or if there is a signal coming from a different space mission or from the ground, then they can change in very short time what the instruments will be doing in the next observation day. Joining us now is Teresa Nieves Chinchilla, and she's the deputy project scientist for Solar Orbiter on the NASA side. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for now, I tell you, me. when I talked to uh, Cesar Garcia, he mentioned, he talked a lot about collaboration, and we actually just heard from Holly about this word collaborate, collaboration. So it seems like, uh, despite being very different missions, a lot of coordination has to take place. So tell me a little bit about your role and how you see this collaboration playing out for Solar Orbiter. So collaboration within the mission has, has been very important. This is a very international uh, mission with you know, a lot of countries putting together efforts and energy to accomplish the goals of this mission. So we have also more collaborations. This is very important with, you know, more missions for NASA like Parker, uh, OSDO, stereo missions. They are very important in our field and working together, we can enhance the outcomes from each mission. Obviously, Solar Orbiter has 10 instruments. Uh, do you happen to have a favorite on the spacecraft? Mm, it is not good, you know, you asked too much <laughs> to say my favorite, but I am heliospheric, so it means that I study the atmosphere of the sun, and I like solo high because I study uh, large structures and I like to see how they evolve in the heliosphere. I like to track them and later to touch them and to sense them with the in-situ instruments. So yeah, but I, I don't know, I don't have a favorite. <laughs> you know, but it's interesting as a scientist, obviously uh -huh. you gravitate towards certain data and, and that's important too, even though right. we like all instruments. Uh -huh. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. We're going to shift focus now to the spacecraft itself. I had a chance to sit down with Ian Walters, who's the project, uh, project manager for Airbus for Solar Orbiter. Let's check it out. We're here at Astrotech Space Operations in Florida with the European Space Agency project manager for the Solar Orbiter spacecraft, Ian Walters. Ian, you're responsible for the entire spacecraft. So tell us, what are the key features of the Solar Orbiter? Well, I think the one feature that most people will realize is because we're going so close to the sun, we'll need to protect ourselves against that. And the way we do it for this mission is to hide from the sun. We hide behind a heat shield. And the heat shield itself can tolerate the enormous temperatures that we see. We're 42 million kilometers from the sun at the closest approach. It doesn't sound that close to most people, but when you think we're 150 million kilometers here on Earth, it's a lot, lot closer. So we expect to see temperatures around 600 degrees centigrade. Most of the spacecraft can't tolerate that kind of temperature, but the heat shield can. So we design specifically a shield for that purpose, and we hide behind a shield for the, for the entire 10 years of the mission. I know that other spacecrafts travel close to the sun and require a heat shield. But how do you test a heat shield that has to endure that kind of heat? It's a good question. So we can't test a spacecraft, the entire spacecraft at 600 degrees. We have to test the components themselves, and then we do an all-up spacecraft test, but at lower temperature. 
So the heat shield itself has been exposed to those kind of temperatures. We built a bespoke test environment in which we could reach the temperature. So the heat shield has been tested to 600 degrees. Also, the elements that poke out into the solar environment as well. So the solar arrays, for instance, and the high gain antenna, they both also see 600 degree uh, temperatures. So they've also been tested to those temperatures as well. Now, uh, you said 10 year mission. So it's one thing to tolerate that kind of temperature. How do you test for that amount of time? Well, we don't test, of course, in, uh, on the ground for 10 years. Um, we do material level tests, accelerated tests of the materials to show that they can tolerate the full duration of the mission. For instance, we have special coatings. We have something called Embio Black, which is very, very black. You know, I think it's one of the blackest materials we've ever flown in space. Um, and we've made sure that it stays black and it doesn't degrade under the intense uh, radiation environment you find close to the sun. Um, we also have a material called Embio White, uh, very much similar to Embio Black, but white. Um, problem with white paint is that they can start to go gray under extreme ultraviolet exposure. So we've tested those materials, those coatings, uh, with accelerated tests to show that they will survive the 10 years. Obviously, the heat shield is a big challenge. You seem to have taken care of that. What are some of the other challenges on this mission? Because you have a lot of instruments on board. Yes, that's right. We have 10 instruments altogether. Six of them are what we call remote sensing instruments. So they look at the sun through the heat shield or next to the heat shield. We also have four in-situ instruments, which measure the environment around the spacecraft, so the local environment. So 10 instruments is a lot. Each has their own unique challenges. Uh, each instrument will bring uh, specific requirements to the spacecraft design, and some of those can be real challenges, real design drivers at spacecraft level. I'll give you one example. We have an extremely sensitive magnetometer on board. It measures the magnetic fields local to the spacecraft in the plasma being emitted from the sun. It's extremely important to measure the magnetic fields around the sun. It seems we don't have yet a very good model of how the sun works in terms of its magnetic fields and so on. And so we're taking a very, very sensitive magnetometer there to find out. Of course, what we don't want to measure is the magnetic field of the spacecraft. So we have to make sure the spacecraft effectively disappears as far as its magnetic field is concerned. How to make a spacecraft out of material which is non-magnetic is quite difficult. There are features of the spacecraft that have to use magnets. The reaction wheels, for instance. These are spinning wheels that we use to control the pointing of the spacecraft, which is, as you can imagine, so important that we hide behind the heat shield yes. all the time for 10 years <laughs> that we don't accidentally depoint from the sun. Um, so those reaction wheels are critical for the mission, but they have spinning magnets inside. We have to make them disappear. So we built a special uh, shield around those uh, reaction wheels made out of new metal, which is a, a very strong attenuator of magnetic field. But we couldn't easily measure it. As you know, the Earth's magnetic field is uh, you know, much, much higher than the, the signal we want to measure. So we have to make the Earth's magnetic field disappear as well in order to measure how effective those shields were. We did it at reaction wheel level. We were sure the shielding would be good. We also get some shielding from the spacecraft components again, but we were looking for an attenuation of a million, million times less field from the wheels by the time it gets to the magnetometer. Very difficult to test. And in fact, we could only test those at spacecraft level in a special chamber in the woods in Germany, which effectively makes the Earth's magnetic field disappear. And then we can really see what signal is coming out of the reaction wheels and can it be measured by the magnetometer. And I'm pleased to say when we did that test last June, we could not see the wheels at all. Yeah? The shields were completely effective. Wow. So this is a, just one example of how a, an instrument requirement can have a very strong drive on a spacecraft design. Hey guys, I'm Daryl, and this is Mick, and you're a vehicle systems engineer with Launch Services Program, and of course, behind us, the noise you can hear is the mighty Atlas V, United Launch Alliance's rocket, rolling to the pad as we speak. Mick, we're just about, what, 50, 60 feet away from this thing. It's impressive. Oh, it's very impressive, Daryl. Uh, happy to be out here for Solar Orbiter. This is great access to be able to see roll to the pad today. The team has done a great job. They've been on time. Everything's looking good. And as you can see, we're just a few seconds away from getting that thing into Launch Complex 41 and uh, prepared to get ready for tomorrow's launch. Tell me a little bit about the rollout. It started at around 10.15 this morning. We had probably about six football field length trip from the vertical integration facility out here to the pad. Yeah, it does. The team the team started early this morning, got preps done inside the vertical integration facility, raising up decks, 
moving things, changing over the environmental control system from the tower, the VIF, uh, to the mobile launch platform. Then they got rolled out of the pad, like you said, about 10:15. they rolled out of the VIF, started moving. It takes about 15 minutes for them to travel the 1,800 feet uh, from the VIF to the pad. They travel just under three miles an hour once they get moving. Really impressive sight to see the mighty Atlas V rolling out here today. And now we're probably just about, oh, what would you say, 60, 70 feet from being into the pad. Absolutely, we're very close to them getting everything put down and hooked back up. And when they get that hooked up, it kind of explain this, because what we're seeing behind us, you can see in the picture, are some railroad tugs that are pushing that mobile launch platform with a rocket on it and pulling its uh, support systems behind it, right? How does it go into the pad there? Yeah, so the uh, clean pad concept that ULA has for the Atlas V is they roll out of the VIF using tugs pushing the mobile launch platform, like you said. So they don't have a fixed umbilical tower or anything like that. It's a mobile launch platform. They get that moving down the, the tracks and put behind the uh, whole setup, they have their environmental control system on, on a trailer type thing. They get that into the pad, they push the support trailers into the concrete bunkers and get the uh, vehicle and the mobile launch platform over the flame bucket and set it in place. And then they do the hookup from the environmental control system to the pad systems. And then they get the auto couplers for the commodities, the locks and uh, hydrogen fuels for the Atlas vehicle uh, to be able to get everything ready for tomorrow's launch. Once they get that rocket in there, is it, does the countdown begin or how does that work? So actually we've started in what we call the uh, F minus one day count, which is the rollout and everything. Once they get it all in and out, they will actually begin the launch countdown, getting ready for tomorrow's with some built in holds, several long hour holds, and then picking up the count tomorrow about 6 p.m. The team will come on con console and getting everything ready for a launch at 11.03 Eastern time tomorrow night. All right, Mick Wolpman, vehicle system engineer with Launch Services Program. We appreciate you. It was impressive to watch this rocket roll right by us just a few feet away. We're going to wrap it up for now and send it back to the guys at the gantry. Thanks a lot, Daryl. I, I, I tell you what, that Atlas V wasn't built here. It took a journey of its own all the way from Decatur, Alabama. And you had a chance to, to talk with the captain, Captain John, of, of, this, of the boat that actually transported the Atlas V all the way to Kennedy. Let's check that out. After years of watching ULA launches, one of my biggest questions was, how do they transport their rockets from their facility in Decatur, Alabama, to the Cape? It turns out they have their own boat to do just that. It was cool to see all the inner workings of the ULA rocket ship, and I couldn't wait to learn more from Captain John. Captain John, this is a very impressive ship, but I wanna know, how long have you been captain of the rocket ship? Okay, this is uh, my ninth year captain of the rocket ship. I've worked uh, all the positions as made to make it to this position, so, yeah, nine years. So you've had a lot of experience transporting these important payloads, such as Atlas boosters and Centaur stages and the like. Is this ship uniquely designed to carry these incredible boosters? It is. The vessel was drawn up by naval architect with shallow water in, in mind. We go places that other commercial vessels of this size cannot go. We have air draft limitations, and then we have wake problems, so they designed the hull that uh, we have minimum effect in uh, shallow water areas. We make a speed in the inland waters roughly about 10 knots. We have about 1,300 miles of rivers to travel. So there's challenges along the way with high river conditions and low river conditions, heavy currents and uh, no currents. We always, uh, in these river trips, we have to take these ever-changing circumstances into account part of our passage plan. How do you account for these river changes? Does that affect when you can go pick up a booster or? It's, it's, a, it's a very thorough process. We uh, generate uh, roughly about 30, 40 page document of uh, data that we expect from regulatory agencies, from the mariners that ha happen to be out there they do reporting, it gets put into the local notice to Mariners. We'll pull that information. We have a uh, meeting with the crew before we sail, and uh, we'll literally review 1,300 miles of river before we ever leave the dock. Wow. Well, I guess that's important since you're carrying this incredible, important booster or rocket. Got to make sure it gets there safely. Sure. And we're all aware aboard the uh, rocket ship 
of how valuable it is to get the flight hardware from Decatur, Alabama, here to Cape Canaveral, Florida. So part of the passage planning, we take into account the value of the cargo, what we have. The weather routing is also very important out at sea. At times, we'll have to weather route around a system in order to assure uh, a good ride for the equipment and, of course, the crew. Do you ever weather route, say, to the point where you end up at an exotic tropical location like Cozumel or Jamaica or? I wish. <laughs> well, I <laughs> but, mean, like, for safety. Well, uh, it, it, seriously, we get into the deep part of the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, usually we may just alter out maybe 50 to 100 miles. We, we can see things developing. Forecasting is really good compared to 40 years ago. You, you know, we keep in mind that uh, we're very close to Cuba. If we're weather routing, then we have to keep that in mind. We, we have to, you know, make sure that we're, uh, you know, keeping a safe space, you know, from Cuba. What size crew do you have here on the rocket ship? We have a 16-man uh, crew that's required uh, by, by the billet uh, set by the Coast Guard. When we're on the rivers, we expand somewhat. We have uh, two river advisors that basically are uh, turbo pilots that have a heavy tow experience. So we'll take them aboard and then have an 18-man crew. So as captain of the rocket ship, do you have to think differently based on the type of payload you're carrying, whether it's like a Delta II or a Delta versus an Atlas or anything of the sort? Yes, we do. The Delta is more robust. It's a boat down to the deck type of uh, configuration. As opposed to the Atlas, Atlas will come on a trailer and we'll have chains. So you do have to take it into account the method that we're securing uh, the cargo. We, we want to avoid heavy rolling, so we may alter course and point up a little bit into the seas and uh, alter that rolling and dampen it somewhat. So yes, we do have to take that into consideration. And, and what's your record uh, on successfully delivering rockets? Are you like 20 and 0 or? We have a perfect record aboard the rocket ship. Just like the flight hardware itself that goes up, we have a perfect record here and we, we do get the payload here on time. So you're basically undefeated. We are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know the right number on it, but I could, I could say that if we made voyage number 133, I made half of them. So I, I'd say I did about 70 trips. 70 and 0, that's, that's almost uh, like that's top NBA record. Slam dunk. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. I tell you what, we had a great show today. We learned a lot about Solar Orbiter, the Sun, and of course the Atlas V vehicle. Let's take one last look at the pad. It looks like rollout is just about complete. What a, what a sight to see. You're watching NASA Edge. An inside and outside look at all things NASA. I have spoken.